Good evening. Just uh, two quick announcements. One, you'll hear me pray for it uh, later during worship service. Uh, the James Gansamore family, I think most people would know them because he was an intern here years ago. Hmm. Uh, their family, or um, James's wife and their four children were in a car accident on the way to church today, and their car was totaled. And everyone is okay. They're all home from a hospital, x-rays, so praise God uh, for his care. Um, and then uh, just a reminder that we'll fellowship outside again. Let's continue to uh, prepare our hearts to worship God. The call to worship. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts endure forever. Let's turn to number nine in our Trinity hymnals and sing together, All You That Fear Jehovah's Name. your holy presence. We praise you, our Father, for electing a people for yourself before the foundation of the world and sending your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer. 
We adore you, Lord Jesus, for you are before all things. In you all things consist. You are the head of the body, the church. You were in the beginning. You are the firstborn from the dead, and in all things you have the preeminence. In you all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily, and we adore you, for you have reconciled all things to yourself, having made peace through your blood on the cross. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for not leaving us comfortless, but sending your Spirit. We ask that the same Spirit that raised up our Lord Jesus Christ would descend on us this evening, that we might worship you aright, die more and more unto sin, and live more and more unto righteousness until that day when we shall be like you, for we shall see you as you are. These things we pray and ask in the name of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our scripture reading this evening will come from the book of Psalms, chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1, this can be found on page 568 in your pew Bible. Let's give our attention to the infallible Word of God. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. May the Lord sanctify us through his truth. His word is truth. You may be seated. Let's sing praise to the Lord our God with hymn number 235, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. As we go to the Lord in our pastoral prayer, I will remind us that as we pray and I lead us in prayer, we are all praying together to the Lord. So let us go now to the Lord our God in prayer. O Lord, our God and our Father, you are indeed great and awesome in all your ways. You keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and with those who keep your commandments. 
O Lord, we have sinned and committed iniquity against your very face. We have done wickedly and rebelled against you, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. We have not walked in your laws, which you have set before us in your word. O Lord, righteousness, mercy, and forgiveness belong to you, but to us, shame of face, because we have sinned against you. O Lord, we pray and ask that you would let not your anger and your fury be upon us, but that you would turn such things away from your people because of our sins and forgive us of all our unrighteousness. We ask that you would cause your face to shine upon us this evening and upon your whole church. Forgive, O Lord, and incline your ear to our prayers, for we are a needy people in need of you. We need you, O Lord, for your church is weak. Outside of our church there are the attacks of the world. Inside our church are the attacks of errors and heresies that the devil would surely love for us to fall prey to. Few of us are gathered in number as the promises of the world are so widely deceitful. We plead with you, O God, to destroy every love for the world that is within us. Help us to be content with our lot, not to love money and other things that are quickly passing away from us or us from them, but help us, O Lord, to love Christ, to put on Christ, and to give no place for the lusts of the flesh. O Lord, we ask that you would help your church to witness to you boldly in these uncertain and sometimes distressing times. May we not be as those who hide in the caves for fear of their lives, but those who tell the world of the way of salvation and life eternal through Jesus Christ. We ask that you would use this time to lay bare the lies of every false religion that promise peace and hope where there is neither peace nor hope. Cause the kingdom of Satan to be destroyed and the kingdom of grace to be advanced that many might be brought into it and kept in it, and that the kingdom of glory might be hastened. We ask, O Lord, that you would help us to fear you, even as we have sung, that we might obey you, that we might be planted firmly on your word to do your will in all things, even as your angels do your will in heaven. May we not read your law and say, I can't do it. Leave it to Jesus. But with thanksgiving to Jesus, who kept the law perfectly for us, Help us, O Lord, with joy to seek to obey you in all things in gratitude for the great work of grace that you have wrought for us in Jesus Christ. O Lord, we have many needs, and we ask that you would grant to us this day our daily bread. Be with those that are sick. We remember Donna Spiller and Ellen Morgan, the Hunts. And O Lord, we also remember tonight Emma Davis, who is again suffering with another out with cancer. O Lord, we ask that you would protect her in her fight. We ask, Lord, you would give her doctors wisdom, that you would use the medicine that she is given to, uh, to do that which it is intended for, to kill the cancer, and that you would protect and preserve her life and comfort her family as they go through this trial again. We remember others who are sick tonight, and we ask that you would heal them. We ask or we thank you, Lord God, for your protection over the Gansevoort family in the car accident today. O oh Lord, how great you are to give us such safety and health each and every day. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the measure of the good things of this life that you have blessed us with. Help us, O oh Lord, not to take these things and scoff at them or to forget them, but to give thanks to God, the giver of every good and perfect gift which comes from above. We ask, Lord, that you would protect this church and all churches and their members from the disease that is ravishing our land and even the world. We thank you, O Lord, for the measure of protection that you've given us. Please help your people not to fear the disease, but help us to fear the Lord. O Lord, we ask for our labors as a church that you would bless them, that we might all work honestly with our hands and minds and provide for our own households well and also provide for the household of God. 
Help us, O Lord, to seek first your kingdom and righteousness, knowing that all of the things that we need, our clothing, our food, are known well by you, and you will surely add them unto us. We remember this evening the persecuted, even many around the world who are in prison this night, not because of any evil sin or action that they have committed, but because of the name that they have professed, even your name, the name of the Lord Jesus. We ask that you would deliver them and cause them to be able to rejoice in the midst of their trials, that they might even be able to sing in the dark places that they are being kept. May they look up to heaven in their torments and see Jesus Christ, their advocate, standing at the right hand of God. May you convert their captors and redeem a great people for yourself, even from the suffering of these saints. O Lord, we remember those places of civil unrest. We have experienced some in this country, and we ask that you would cause it to cease. And yet, O Lord, we know that in places, especially Ethiopia, these past two weeks, there has been civil unrest that has cost the lives of hundreds, displaced thousands, even the relatives of our own church members. We ask, O Lord, that you would please bring peace to that land, cause the gospel of Jesus Christ to go forth from the churches, and we ask that you would bring conversions to those, those, um, the different tribes and groups of people who are at war with each other. May they be at peace through the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. We ask, Almighty God, that you would give to us the heart of forgiveness and kindness, even that we um, might Forgive one another, trusting that as we forgive others, we can have confidence that our God and Father in heaven will forgive us. Forgive us, O Lord, for holding grudges against one another. May we not be filled with pride, but may we esteem each brother and sister in Christ as higher than ourselves. Help husbands to love, honor, and cherish their wives. Enable wives to love, honor, and obey their husbands. Strengthen children in obedience to their parents, that we as families, as individuals, as a church, might show forth the grace, glory, love, and honor of Jesus Christ, even in the way that we love one another. We ask, O Lord, that you would please keep us free from temptations and sins. Free us as a country and as a land from the sin of pornography and all manner of lust, and remove it, O Lord, remove it from our, our homes, from the internet, remove it from this land, and especially, O Lord, from our minds and our heart. Please remove greed and envy and pride and all manner of sin from us. Grant to us the whole armor of God that we might be able to stand against the fiery darts of the evil one. And as we stand, O Lord, to contend earnestly for the faith that was once delivered to the saints in all ages. O Lord, may your people look to Jesus Christ for all strength and ascribe wisdom, power, and glory to you alone, trusting in you to work out in your good time and according to your good pleasure the answers to all of these requests and petitions that we bring before you this evening. To God, our Savior, be all glory, power, and majesty, both now and forevermore, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of preparation this evening will be hymn number 146, Break Thou the Bread of Life. Please rise to sing 146.
Let us remain standing as we turn in 1 John chapter 1, tonight to verses 5 through 7. First John chapter 1, beginning at verse 5. Let us give our reverent attention to this God's very word. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his Son, cleanses us from all sin. The grass withers and flower fades, but God's word abides forever. You may be seated. Let us pray. O Lord, we do thank you that you are the God who has revealed yourself in faithfulness and in truth. And so now this evening, We do pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, our rock and redeemer. In Christ we pray. Amen. You open your computer and you need to do some work, but the notification comes up. Your software or your operating system needs updating. You have an old version. So now it's time to get the 2.0 or 3.0 edition. Some wrongly treat the gospel as if it needs updating or upgrading. The gospel 2.0 or 3.0. But as we saw this morning, the gospel as proclaimed by the apostles and delivered to the church is unchanging. It needs no amendment, no addition, No supplementing, for as it is given, it is sufficient and it is perfect because it gives to us our perfect Savior and his finished work. In verses 1 through 5, uh, 1 through 4, we saw that this was called the word of life. Tonight, we come to verses 5 through 7, and this word of life is now the word of light. The same word, the word of life, now focuses us on the God who is light. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light. This statement really will set the theme for the first part of 1 John. God is light. The second part of the book will focus on God is love. And so around these two grand themes revolves John's teaching. God is light, and God is love. And so we can take this as really belonging to the essence of this marvelous epistle. As we consider this passage tonight, We'll do so in two points. Firstly, basking in the light, and secondly, walking in the light. Well, firstly, basking in the light. A lot of religious groups in the time of John had very secretive rituals and procedures. Uh, You would have uh, in Asia Minor, likely uh, very uh, similar to the churches that are addressed in Revelation 2 and 3, uh, you would have these kind of mystery religions with a lot of bizarre stuff happens behind uh, closed doors. And often these religions would end with a priest lighting a torch and meeting those who have gone through the ceremonies. And so the idea was very prevalent that you start in the shadows, you start in the darkness, but you end in the light. But while they think they're in the light, 
Apart from Christ, there is only darkness. Darkness of the deepest and most fearful kind. Jesus teaches in his Sermon on the Mount, if your eye is bad, namely unwilling and unable to see God and his kingdom, your whole body, Jesus says, is full of darkness. If the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. I don't know how many of you have experienced this palpable and distressing darkness. One time in college, I went caving, and our uh, cave guide uh, told us to wear these helmets with lights on top of them. And uh, about halfway through, uh, she said, okay, everyone turn off your headlamps. And you could put your hand right in front of your nose and not see a thing. That was heavy and deep darkness. Listen to Isaiah chapter 8 as the prophet says of the idolaters. When they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? To the teaching and to the testimony. And then listen to this. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. They have no dawn. It is pitch midnight black for those apart from the Lord and his light. The world is full of this darkness, and if you're like me, perhaps you've felt this darkness in the world a little more keenly, and it weighs heavily upon us. The violence, the spite, the evil, upsetting, unsettling, horrendous. What to do? Where to go? Not to human solutions, not to princes, put no confidence in princes, nor for help on man depend. But we turn to God, who has unveiled his light for us. God is light. John, in this passage, is inviting us to come out of the shadows, to come out of the darkness, and into the light. The Psalms tell us that God clothes himself with a garment of light. And, in the Psalms, with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. The luminosity of God, his brightness. Wherever he is, there is light. Augustine writes, desire it we can, long for it we can, pant after it we can, but worthily conceive it, worthily unfold it in words, we cannot. The light so marvelous, so glorious, it can't be captured in human terms. John is speaking of God as light, the light before there were earthly creation lights of the light of the sun to rule the day and the light of the moon and the stars to rule the night. You know, God has always been this light for his people. One day in the desert, there is Moses herding his sheep. And he notices a bush on fire. And it keeps burning and burning. But the bush is not consumed. The flame does not dissipate. And he hears a voice, Moses. Moses comes near and who does he encounter? He encounters the God of such magnificent and majestic 
light, undimmed and unfading light. God is light. We see light that waxes and wanes, but the light of the Lord, there is no twilight or sunset. It shines like the noonday sun. Israel marching through the wilderness, a very dangerous and dark place. And what does God provide? But a pillar of cloud for shade by day, and a pillar of fire for light by night. This cloud turns into the brightest night light you will ever see. A triumphant torch of salvation that leads the way, to guide the way, to illumine their steps so they will not stumble and so they will not fall. The purity of this light. Notice, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Taking the Greek in a literal way, and darkness in him, not is there none at all, whatsoever. Micah, the prophet's, says, Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. And so what do we do? We soak in this light. We bathe and bask in the light of God's revelation. In the hymn, my God, how wonderful thou art. It says, My God, how wonderful thou art, thy majesty, how bright. How beautiful thy mercy seat in depths of burning light. How wonderful, how beautiful the sight of thee must be. Thine endless wisdom, boundless power, and awesome purity. God is light. The God who, of whom John, John is writing, is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God in Christ is this light. The light of God, the God who is light, has shown his light in the face of his Son, Jesus Christ. The true light, John 1 says, which gives light, was coming into the world. He was that lamp shining in the darkness. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. When Jesus is raised from the dead, this redeeming light shines in all its full intensity and glory. Luke chapter 2, For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. The light, which is put on a hill, and it becomes that city set on a hill whose light cannot be hidden. Jesus, then, is the light which does not simply flash and vanish, but the light which is manifest and remains and continues to shine. This is the light of your present as you believe upon the Lord. Jesus promises, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. This is not only the light of your present, but the light of your future as well. The light of your hope ahead. 
Revelation, the same John who wrote the book of Revelation, was brought into the heavenly throne room of God. And what does he notice? The whole place is saturated and filled with light. He who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Cornelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. And then in the end, he tells us that when the heavenly Jerusalem comes down, we have no need or sun or moon to shine on it. Why? For the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Have you seen this light? And has this light opened your blind eyes and pierced through the darkness of your heart? You know that Dylan Thomas poem, which includes the refrain, Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Christians don't need to rage, to be enraged, because for us, in Christ, in his death and in his resurrection, there is no dying of the light. God in Christ sh shares his light with us, sheds his light upon us in our hearts, and not even death can snuff out that light. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Let us bask in this light and enjoy this light and worship in the light. But secondly, we walk in the light, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. In the book of Job, chapter 24, we read, There are those who rebel against the light. In other words, there are those who, knowing there is light, choose to turn their backs on it and walk in the darkness. John chapter 3 says the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness, those uh, in the darkness, they love the darkness more than the light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. The light which comes to expose and which comes to unveil what is really taking place. The darkness wants to flee and wants its own position. But for us, Christians who have fellowship with God cannot remain in the darkness. Paul tells the Ephesian Christians, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. As we sing in the hymn, Thine eye diffused a quickening ray, I woke the dungeon flamed with light. We walk in the light. There is no dark side to God. In him there is no darkness at all. When we experience a summer's day, soon, without warning, a cloud could appear and bring rain and bring shadows and bring darkness. And so often we live our lives, and if something good happens, if we are the beneficiaries of a, a gift, we have this fear, well, something menacing and Upsetting could be right around the corner. I've experienced success in my work or financially been blessed or things seem to be going well with my family and there is this gnawing sense inside, but what's around the corner? In pagan religion, there was this idea that the gods were capricious and 
irrational, that at any moment they could fly off the handle. So Zeus, one moment, could favor you, but in the next moment could judge you. And so what John is reminding us here is, as God is light and in him there is no darkness at all, not to be afraid because his perfect light has cast out the darkness, as he'll say later on in his letter, perfect love casts out fear. And so we will not be punished. We will not come into judgment because we have passed from darkness to light. Psalm 112, light dawns in the darkness for the upright. Why? For God is gracious, merciful, and righteous. Now, if God is light and in him there is no darkness, what does that mean for our Christian lives? It means for us as we walk in the light, there should be no dark side to our lives either. There should be no gray areas for that matter. We can't be children of the day and then wake up in the middle of the night and go about performing sinful and evil deeds. What fellowship, Paul asks, has light with darkness? What fellowship has Christ with Satan? Notice the three if we says in this passage. Verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin. Verse 10, if we say we have not sin. See, in all of these, John heads us off at the pass and answers the objections. So people of God, we cannot have friendship and closeness with God while at the same time neglecting or forsaking the light of his word in our lives. There's no backdoor alliances or handshakes that can be made because light cannot sit across from the table from darkness and enter into a negotiation and compromise. That's ludicrous. We can't have it both ways, John is saying. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we must put off all the deeds of darkness. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we, we walk in the darkness, verse 6, while we claim to be in the light, notice what he says, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now this is a rather surprising phrase, isn't it? We think of truth as something we believe, something we see. But John has a distinctive way of putting it, practice to carry out, to walk in the truth. How does one do truth? It can be understood against the Old Testament backdrop and use of this phrase, meaning to practice fidelity or walk in faithfulness. Genesis 47, verse 29, Jacob to Joseph, and when the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. There is not only then a confession of the light, but there is a walking after the pattern of the light and in the path of the light. Jesus says in John chapter 3, 
Whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. You see, it's one thing for there to be sin in the world. It must grieve us, but it also should not surprise us because the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. But what John is lamenting and what he's sharply warning us about is for those who profess God, but whose lives are a walking contradiction to the truth, that they believe. Yes, I know God's standard for worship, but I'm more interested in the kind of worship that suits my tastes and my fancies. Yes, I know God has told us how to govern and guide and restrain our speech, but I'm going to say what I want, when I want, and how I want. Yes, I believe the Bible tells me about husbands and wives and how they should relate to one another. But I am going to come up with my own definitions because that's the way I like it. This is the kind of attitude that John has no truck for. In Pilgrim's Progress, there is a character named Talkative who is a hypocrite. He knows all the right words. John Bunyan says he can say them right on cue. Quote, he talks of prayer, of repentance, of faith, of the new birth, but he only knows the talk of them. Religion has no place in his heart. All that he has lies in his tongue. Bunyan goes on. He thinks he is on moral high ground when from God's viewpoint he languishes in some dark pit. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Come to the light. And notice verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us, from all sin. Back to fellowship. He said we have fellowship in the Lord as we receive the word of life. We have fellowship with the apostles. We have fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. But now we also walk together in this light. The walk in the light, therefore, is no lonely walk. It's not an isolated walk. The book of Proverbs tells us he who isolates himself seeks his own desires. He breaks out against all sound judgment. If you are in the light, we walk with the family of light, the people of light. Now, as we walk in the light, What will we become more keenly aware of? As God shines that light within us, we will feel more and more our sin. And for that, John has an answer at the end of verse 7. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The light of God will show who we really are. Because the law of God is no mere external matter, it's like the x-ray which gets into the thoughts and intents of the heart and digs up all the darkness within. And so as you come more and more into the light and feel the darkness of your own heart, what do you do? You come back to the promise that John reinforces for us to the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, his son, which cleanses us from all sin. Psalm 32 says, What blessedness belongs to him 
whose sins are forgiven. Blessed is he to whom the Lord does not impute his sin. We do not shift the blame to others. We take the blame ourselves. With David, we say, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. The gospel is not a message that tells us we are not guilty for what we have done. The gospel speaks of the guilt remover, and it speaks of one who came to bear in his body our sins upon the tree. The gospel tells us of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so, when we come in our darkness to the light, we come confessing our sins. And you know, the beautiful thing about the gospel is you don't have to stop being a sinner to come to the Lord. But you come with your sins and as a sinner, and you remember that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. When you look at the law of God and think, I'm guilty of that, God answers back at the cross, I have made a provision for your guilt. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Isn't that wonderful? Every sin. The sin of greed, yes. The sin of pride, the sin of idleness, the sin of bitterness, each and every one of them. Jesus has shed his blood and washed us clean. Dear dying lamb, your precious blood will never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be sa saved to sin no more. And so let us bask in the light, walk in the light, and let us remember that full provision God has made in reconciling us to himself through Christ, the light of the world. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the consolation and peace that we have through it. So we do now pray that you would write this word upon our minds and hearts, and that we would indeed be those living epistles that you have written by your Holy Spirit. We rejoice in you and in your salvation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us close together as we sing number 518, standing together, Christ of all my hopes the ground, number 518.
Following the benediction, we'll sing number 11, verses 1 and 2. Receive his blessing, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Thank you for joining us online today. We believe the Bible to be the true and inerrant word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and practice. With a priority upon corporate worship, we also believe that we glorify God by worshiping him according to the principles of scripture and not the traditions of man. Come, join us at Redeemer as we rejoice in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <laughs> 